There's Charity. Hey. And she's waving goodbye. All right, Romans chapter 8. Let's do this. Romans 8, um, there are several chapters in Romans that could possibly work into our study uh, for this Hall of Fame series, but Romans 8, oh, it's so great. Romans 12, some of you will remember three years ago or four, I think it may have been the last time that I wrote curriculum for Covenant Groups. We did a whole year on chapter 12 of Romans, which is hilarious that we're going to try and do Romans 8 in one night, and I, I do think it is worth reading the whole chapter um, together as a covenant group, frankly, even if that's all you do, um, read this chapter. Uh, and then in your study, as you get into the questions, you'll probably settle into a piece or a part of the chapter. Um, you're, you're not going to spend your whole night studying, so you're not going to do it all. There's so many beautiful, amazing, wonderful things in here. Some of the richest theology in scripture is contained in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8, I'm sure there's almost certainly someone in your group whose very favorite verse in the Bible comes from Romans chapter 8. There are multiple verses in Romans 8 that could be the lifeline verse. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus is how the chapter begins. Uh, there is, uh, the chapter ends with nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. And a few verses before that, we have the classic, all things work together for good uh, in the lives of those who, who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. That's three verses that could easily be any teenager's very favorite verse in scripture. Um, and we're going to we're gonna do it all. It's, it's a Hall of Fame chapter. You won't be able to do it all, but I do encourage you to read it all. And as I mentioned in the PDF um, study that I sent you, I, every time I read Romans, in whatever chapter I'm in, I always come back to this reality that the church in Rome was in racial turmoil. Um, many years before the writing of this document, uh, a church in Rome had been started by Jews. They had proselytized um, to becoming Christians, some of the Gentiles in Rome. Uh, the Edict of Claudius drove out all the Jews from the city of Rome. So the church in Rome for several years was all Gentile. No Jews could live in Rome. So the Jews that started that church had been jettisoned from the church. And the church existed for several years as an all Gentile church. Then when the Edict of Claudius was lifted, Jews returned back to the city of Rome Jewish Christians returned back to the church in Rome and all hell broke loose among those Christians because Gentiles were doing church in non-Jewish ways and the Jews who started the church returned and, and, and were pulling their hair out saying, how have you abandoned the principles that we founded this church on? And so if you go back and you start reading from the beginning of Romans, you'll, it'll make a whole lot of sense how what Paul is talking, he's talking to Gentiles saying, hey, Jews are special. They belong in your church. They're, they're amazing and, and you're not as great as you think you are. And to Jews, Paul is saying, you know what? You're not as great as you think you are either. Um, Gentiles are, are amazing. You've all messed up. You've all fallen short. We are in this together. And that's the context into which Paul says the things that we are about to read together. Um, so when you see those us, us passages, when the, the we passages, and even some of the you's that I might have as a teenager or college student read from a singular point of view, meaning you, David Rubio, I, I, you know, Paul is probably saying you churches, the church in Rome filled with Jews and Gentiles who, who are having trouble getting along right now. This is happening to you. So uh, let's have that in the back of our minds as we read. Uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Some of you will remember the song, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Cute song, powerful, powerful truth. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So he came looking like a sinner in order to be a sin offering. And so 
in that sinful man, he condemned sin in sinful man to death in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, those of us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but rather according to the spirit. So those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on that uh, which the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Now the mind of sinful man leads to death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit leads to life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to the law of God, and it can't do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature can't, therefore, be pleasing to God. But if the Spirit of God lives in you, then you are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, that person does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, which it is, every one of you, then uh, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And I'm thinking right now of our That's What He Said uh, event last weekend putting to death the misdeeds of the body. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear again, but you received the spirit of sonship or daughtership. And by Christ, we cry to God, Abba, calling him Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We are God's children. And as a parent, I know you're, you're, it's impossible to hear that and not think about the reality that we are children of God the way Madeline Vincent Charity are children in my home. Um, we're all not, we're, you know, not all of us are parents. All of us have been children, of course, at some point. Um, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we belong to God as family. We are children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings so that we may share in his glory also. I consider that our present sufferings aren't even worth comparing with the glory that we will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons and daughters of God to be re revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. This is God's deal. He's doing this in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God, freedom which we can now have. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up until now. Not only this, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, hearkening back now to Galatians chapter 5, which we read in our very first Bible study, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait, eagerly awaiting our adoption as sons and daughters and eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But it's not a hope because it's not a hope that we see. Hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we don't yet have, we wait for it patiently. And in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groans that we cannot express in words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit is interceding for the saints in accordance with God's will. And so we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For some, God foreknew, and those he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, Jesus, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. Remember, co-heirs with Christ. 
And the ones that he predestined, he also called. And the ones he called, he also justified. And the ones he justified, he also then glorified. So what do we say in response to this? All this predestination and this calling and this justification and this glorification, what's our response to all these things that we're hoping for? If God is for us, who can be against us? The one who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with Christ, give us all things? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? And remember, those whom God has chosen includes all of the Christians in the Roman church. It includes all of the Christians in the Otter Creek Church of Christ, in the OCYG, in the church you know, much larger than, than our building. Um, so who will bring a charge? It is God who justifies. Who can condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died, and even more than that, the one who was raised to life, he is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So now we have two intercessors, the Spirit, and here now we have Christ at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. Verse 35, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Can any of these separate us from the love of God in Christ? It is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I didn't, I didn't ask this um, in the study, but one of the questions I thought about asking was just to see what can we add to this list? Let's just name it. What is something that teenagers can sometimes feel separates them from God that is not already listed here? And let's just name those things. Um, that could be a cool experience for you. Paul is saying there is nothing in all creation, nothing that we can see or not, uh, nothing, nothing at all that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So we're 13 minutes in. Um, I am praying that your, your discussion will go well. I'm praying that um, wherever you camp in Romans chapter eight and however this study plays into your time together that this coming covenant group will be a blessed time. Uh, like I said in my email, it's been a while since we've met and we're gonna miss another meeting in, in two weeks when we, when we get to Christmas. Um, so I hope you will be thinking about creative ways uh, to not just get your group together, but to be connected at the heart level with the students that you love so much. Thank you for being Covenant Group Leaders. I hope this study has been a blessing to you. You cannot beat Romans chapter eight. Good grief, what a beautiful, beautiful chapter. Thank you, Lord, for um, sending Jesus Christ to the earth to um, change everything about the way we live, uh, to, to uh, claim us to you, to prove um, th in, in every way visible and invisible, that we are yours. And uh, we thank you so much for what this means to, to us individually and also for what it means to us collectively as a community. Uh, we love you, and it's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have a great study. We'll see you guys. Uh, uh, and if I don't see you again between now and Christmas, Merry Christmas.